Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Notre Dame Newman Center and University Church for a lecture on one of the hot, hottest topics in Ireland today. Every day, our papers are filled with articles exploring housing shortages, high real estate prices, and related questions about the government's economic policies that contribute to our current situation. National Economic and Social Council reports and government policy statements have also attempted to address the nature and depth of this crisis. This reality is poised to impact families and the quality of life in Ireland for generations to come. This is a timely topic and welcome reflection on these pressing issues. Tonight's presentation, Housing, Public Policy, and Common Good, seeks to reframe the matter in terms of common goods as explored in Catholic social thought, exploring some neglected lines of thought that might prove helpful in understanding the current crisis. Dr. Reardon is clear that there is no simple solution, no magic bullet to solving the situation in which we find ourselves, but hopes that the lens of common good might help us to understand the thinking behind our public policy decisions while serving to inform its future formulation. Dr. Patrick Reardon, SJ, Senior Fellow for Political Philosophy and Catholic Social Thought at Campion Hall in Oxford, has explored the common goods in a number of articles and books across the years. His book, Recovering Common Good, Veritas 2017, received the 2021 Economic and Society Prize by Rome's Santissimus Annus Pro Pontifice. Pontifice. My Latin is Porifice. <laughs> His other works include Philippine, uh, Philippian Common, oh, Philippine Common Goods, A Good Life for All from Davio 2016, and Global Ethics and Global Common Good, Bloomsbury 2015. He has addressed issues such as secularism and politics, capital punishment, law and morality, constitutional change, and people power in published works across his career. A priest and scholar in the classic Jesuit tradition, we are honored to welcome him to this church built by John Henry Newman, a man who believed deeply in the broad and free exchange of ideas so that well-educated men and women of goodwill might inform their intellects and work together to make our world a more welcoming and hospitable place for all of God's creatures. I ask you now to welcome warmly our speaker for tonight, Patrick Reardon. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for this invitation to speak, with, speak to you and meet you on this very urgent issue that is a concern for us all, I think. Um, this is one of my favorite television programs, Air Crash Investigation. You might know it. Uh, there's a plane crash, there have been so many over history, but the team investigates looking for the cause. Was it a design fault? Was it pilot error? Was it bad maintenance? Was it weather or terrorism or whatever? And it's a real exercise in finding causes. But they're very clear their primary purpose is not to assign blame. It's not about finding fault and see who can be punished. It's about understanding the causes so that people can learn and do something to prevent those kinds of accidents happening again. You may be familiar with, in our sister island, the United Kingdom, the NHS, the National Health Service. It has a real problem with malpractice suits, with faults in surgery, and the managerial people who want to save money, achieve targets, they don't favor whistleblowers who want to point out the mistakes that were made. There's a great reluctance to admit mistakes. And of course, people suffer as a result. But the surgeons and the medical profession are learning from the experience of air crashes that they have to handle their own mistakes differently. Be open about them, honest about them, and learn from them. And those simple checks that pilots do before they fly, you know, two people going through the checklist and two affirming, yes, we've done all those things. If that were done before operations and surgery, there would be fewer um, malpractice suits, and that's one of the things they have learned. Now, 
In our discussion tonight, I don't want to assign fault or see who is to blame for the crisis that we're in. And the NEST reports are pretty good, the National Economic and Social Council, are very good on recognizing that there's no point blaming actors in the public space who use the power that they have to pursue their own interests when it is the system as a whole that gives them the power that they have and the opportunities that they have. So what we need to look at is the system as a whole. This is something that uh, I think we can learn from John Stuart Mill. He's one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, not always popular among Catholic readers, I'm afraid. Some people misread him when he writes about experiments in living. They think that what he's advocating is experiment with drugs, sex, loose living, try it out and see. No, he, writing in the middle of the 19th century, in the middle of social upheaval in England as a result of industrialization and the flight from the land, and recall he's a member of parliament, he's trying to find out how can we learn from this chaos what works in the interests of the human as a progressive being, the human as a being capable of development, of progress, of reaching out to more than simply survival. And that is why he appealed for there to be liberty. So his great essay on liberty is quoted, of course, because of the harm principle that we have learned from him. The law and society should not restrict the liberty of people except where the exercise of liberty is threatening harm to others or to society. Mill says it's only one simple principle, but it's actually quite complex. Harm to others or harm to the society. But of course, liberty is needed in Mill's view, not for its own sake, but so that there could be the open discussion and reflection on our experience to see from what our history shows us how we can learn to live more humanely, more adequately, to live better. His own life was an experiment in living. You may be aware of that. He was raised by his father, James Mill, according to the utilitarian philosophy of Bentham, where pain and pleasure were the two guiding principles in life. And he had a breakdown. And he realized his breakdown was not explained by his upbringing, his, his philosophy, nor was it helped by it to find a resolution. His solution came through an effective relationship with uh, Mrs. Taylor and then also through his discovery of romantic poetry and then he realized there were more goods in life than pleasure the, and no, one of the worst things in life too than pain. So this is what I'm suggesting we need to do in facing into the housing crisis. We all know it's a crisis. In fact, Michael D. Higgins was bold enough to say, the president, it's a disaster. But we need to look at it with a view to learning what is causing this, why has it come about? Not with a view to finding who we can blame and who we can punish for it, but so that we can learn how to handle it and overcome it and move on to something better. <coughs> so we have to look back on our own history, our century of independence in Ireland. What has gone well? What has gone less well? What has gone badly? Can we learn from that so as to do better for the next century? And I draw your attention to Pope Francis writing in Laudato Si, addressing the whole climate and environmental crisis, and he is using this see, judge, act template, which was developed also in the 19th century for young Christian workers in Belgium. Look around, see what's happening, evaluate it, come to a judgment, and then learn to act so as to address that situation. Francis himself uses a different trilogy, contemplate, discern, and propose actions. But it's the same strategy, and that's what I hope my brief talk tonight will, will help us to do. So the outline of my talk has three sections. The first is learning from experience. Can we learn from our experience? And the second one is, how do we evaluate that experience? So we need to assemble resources for evaluation and 
um, develop criteria that we will apply to judge the form of judgment. And then in the third section, which is the shortest of the three, let's see how we can apply these criteria to what has been our experience. So on to the first section. Well, our economy is a big part of that experience and it's also relevant to the housing crisis. Is our economy working well? And we need to review that experience. And what I'm suggesting, and I'll go into this a little more fully in a moment, that we need to review our experience in relation to the institutions of property, access to land, the functioning of markets, the structuring of financing, the role of government, central and local, and also the legal instruments available to us, not least the compulsory purchase orders. Now this, reflecting on experience that I'm summarizing here, it's not my own work that I'm relying on. I'm relying on work that has been done by a number of organizations, not least the NEST, National Economic and Social Council, that has produced a number of very valuable reports. And the Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice have done two there that I mentioned come out this year. But also Justice for Ireland and Mercy Law, also Catholic inspired um, institutions that are reflecting on our crisis and proposing instruments and tools for uh, addressing it. And so this is not my own work, I'm drawing from them, but then addressing it in the next section to identify, well, uh, what criteria, what questions can we bring to bear so as to form a judgment on what that experience teaches us. Now, on the whole, of course, these reports accept there is a crisis. So the judgment in overall is a negative one. Um, now here's the first of five elements I want to pick out that the reports are, ident are identifying as significant uh, points of crisis in our way of addressing uh, housing in the country. The first I'm summarizing, there's a number of things come into play here. The land, access to land for building and how there is a land price trap um, NESC in particular has done a lot of work on this and they have identified how the market for housing is competitive at the wrong points. The market for housing is so structured that competition is concentrated on getting land and that is uh, unfortunate because the bidding for land squeezes uh, both the end price uh, what builders can demand from the purchasers, and it also squeezes costs. So in order to be able to produce houses that are uh, marketable, they are cutting costs and reducing the quality of the house. But where the competition should be at the end of the process of house production uh, in terms of the quality of houses and their price, it's put much earlier in the whole system. The building the bidding for land is the main focus and leading therefore to land hoarding by builders who try and get ahead of competition in order to have access to building land. With the result that our market as we structure it, the market for housing is not delivering the objective we would wish to have from it. And we can ask, and I'll come back to this, who benefits from that way in, of structuring the market? Whose interests are disadvantaged? A major issue for the public body, NESC, is how the value of land is increased, of course, by the provision of servicing. So, you know, um, sewage and water supply and, so, and roads, but then also transport facilitation. When the Lewis or the Dart is expanded, that pushes up the price of land for the people who can have access to those transport, transport possibilities. So the big question is, how can the public share in the rise of the value of land and property, that rise that has been contributed to by public investment and by public effort. 
zoning, planning, servicing. These are the public uh, interventions that can increase the price and the value of private land, but the public doesn't always get the benefit of that increase. How can that be restructured? The second issue that arises is the role of property rights in our culture. And you'd excuse me for a minute if I take one of my magic pills so that my mouth remains moist. <laughs> Thank you. Property rights in our culture. Is the protection of property exaggerated in our culture? Uh, we have in the 1937 Constitution a very strong defense protection of property rights, but is it exaggerated? We see the difficulty that there has been in the jurisprudence when government, for the sake of the common good, is attempting to acquire land that property owners defend the almost the absolute quality of their property rights in court. There is, of course, the assurance in the Constitution that com compensation will be given. But it is a question for us as we look back over our history and see is there an imbalance there between the interests of the public, of the common good, and the interests of property owners? Although the uh, statement is made that land can be acquired when it is needed for public use, are the instruments available to the state sufficiently strong to counterbalance the affirmation of property in the Constitution? Incidentally, this is not just a problem in the Irish Constitution. Uh, commentators on the European Convention on Human Rights draw attention to the same difficulty because, of course, the European Convention of Human Rights comes out of a history of auto autocratic and tyrannical states, and the whole emphasis is on protecting citizens and their liberties and freedoms from the incursion by uh, overweening state power. But there's also mention there in the Euro European Convention that states should have the power to intervene for the sake of public order, to constrain the exercise of rights, but too little is said about it for it to be effectively implemented or implementable in, in law. A third problem that's identified is that the state has become a tenant. The state no longer part of the provision of housing either from local authority or central authority directly in building and, and renting out, but has engaged <coughs> investment companies who do the building, and then the state becomes, as it were, the tenant, assuring the investment companies of long-term leases of 25 years, perhaps. So they have a guaranteed income from a reliable tenant, namely the state, and then the state sublets to those who are to get social housing. The result is, of course, that after 25 years of payment by the state of taxpayers' money, there's no equity to show for it. The ownership remains with the private investment companies and not with public uh, authorities. Now, this is in a situation where, over years, the state has moved away from direct engagement in building housing, and that's been a long-running process You'll remember also the, the whole pressure on the right to buy, allowing tenants the possibility of buying social housing, uh, with the result that the, the assets of the state and local authority and central government in housing have diminished considerably. Where the state has become a tenant of the investment companies, of course, it is also competing with citizens who are wanting to rent. And the, ten, the, 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 the state is always a, a more powerful uh, bidder and, and client than any individual uh, or group of individuals that might want to rent. So this is a real negative concern among the commentators. The need for state provision. It's not only that it would be good for there to be state provision of social housing, local authority, uh, as well as central government, perhaps. But it is very good for the functioning of the market for housing, that there be that competition that uh, ensures that <clears throat> there is another possibility, social housing, than to be uh, bidding for 
uh, property that is provided by, by speculators or, or building uh, uh, concerns. <clears throat> Government has created a market for, for for-profit providers of social rented housing through the use of long-term leases. Um, sorry, that's the point, the earlier point. The need for state provision, though, is to enter into that market so that there is a complementarity of commercial and public suppliers facilitating a vibrant housing market. Because competition from state suppliers would put pressure on commercial suppliers. There is a difficulty, however, if you advocate, and the, the reports acknowledge this, if you advocate the state getting into the provision of housing more directly again, what about the building industry? Is it up to meeting that increased demand? There are real constraints, they all note, in the availability of firms with the required skills and experience and so on to, to bid for such projects and to contribute to the building uh, needs of the country, where the state too would become uh, one of the clients wanting to uh, have houses built for its own provision to social, for so social housing. So it's important that the building industry develop both in scale and in technological uh, competence so that there, there can be uh, a, a delivery to meet this uh, increased demand. And the fifth area of experience that has been identified uh, both by NESC and especially by uh, the Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice, focusing on experiences that have been uh, modeled in other countries, in Austria, in the Netherlands, where the uh, rent that is charged for housing that's provided is only to meet the costs of provision rather than to uh, offer uh, a profit as well to, to the provider. So this will involve obviously the state being more directly involved in providing. And it also presupposes that there is access to land uh, for building that is relatively um, cheap is not the right word, but, but it isn't an exaggerated price. The documents that I've been looking at, they also indicate how there can be a gradated system of subsidy in such uh, cost rental provision that um, while some households might well be able to meet the rental on uh, the full cost, to what's required to meet the full cost of the provision, other households might need to be subsidized because their income is not sufficient, but the gradation of subsidy is also um, uh, a part of what might be uh, built into this suggestion for the provision of social housing. So, have I turned that off? Yeah, we're back, thank you. So, moving on to section two. So what I've done there is you know, s summarize some of the problems identified from our experience. Uh, issues around property rights, um, I'll say a little bit more about the second point there, our neglect of the universal destination of material goods, you'll recognize that phrase from Catholic social thought. The weakness of state powers, commercial purchase orders to serve the common good, an excessive reliance on markets for investment, the state becoming a tenant, and the need for more direct state engagement to moderate the housing market. Now those are items identified as you know, learning from experience. Now I want to move on to see, well, how do we evaluate that experience? How do we come to form a judgment about it? And hence we have to clarify some criteria, and for that I'm going to ask some very basic questions. Now this is what I do as a philosopher, do the obvious, state the obvious, and you might get it, you might feel it's a bit too obvious, but bear with me. I think it's important that we do address the things that are so self-evident that we should not take them for granted. We should mention them and spell them out. So I'm going to ask a number of basic questions to help 
developed this evaluation. What is an economy? What is an economy? Well, I'm suggesting uh, before I answer that question, of course, just list the other questions I'm going to ask. What is politics? What are the common goods of our economy and polity? Are we achieving our common goods? And if not, why not? And what can we do to change for the better? So these are the, the guiding questions in this second section of my presentation. And the first question then is, what is an economy? Well, I suggest to you that an economy is how a society provides for itself all that it needs to live. It's a bit crude, it's a bit simple, but I think this is adequate and true to our experience. All of the complexity that we take as belonging to the economy, what is it about? It's about how we, our society, provides for itself all that it needs to live. And all is a very encompassing uh, notion and we can list the things included there, food and drink, clothing, shelter, housing, care for the young, the old, the sick. You might be familiar with Plato's Republic. And in Plato's Republic, there's a question about creating a just society. And the people conversing on this topic quickly admit, we're not going to be happy with just having our physical needs met, food and drink and shelter and clothing. That's not going to be enough. To live in such a city would be to live like pigs. We want culture, we want, we want civilization, we want entertainment, we want much more than just to survive, we want to live well. And so an economy is what we rely on to provide all that we want in order to live well. Now notice I'm using the word provide there and not produces. Um, why that? Well, we don't, we don't produce for ourselves all that we need. We rely on others and others' productions and then on trading in order to provide for ourselves all that we need. So our economy, as we are familiar with economy, unless it's a totally subsistence economy delivering only the basic minimum, will rely on markets, will rely on exchange and trade so that we can provide for ourselves all that we need, which is much more than what we can simply produce. Now, all that is needed includes housing, having a home, a shelter, a space to be, to enjoy the privacy needed for intimate relationships, for raising a family, definitely belongs among the conditions for a decent human life, having a home. And the complexity then of what goes into having a dwelling, an apartment, a flat, a house today, reveals how our providing housing relies on complex markets, along with the direct activity of making and constructing. So just think of all of those dimensions of electrics, plumbing, insulation, um, and then the, 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 the uh, facilities that we need for cooking and so on, um, sewage, water supply, all that is needed. It's a complex uh, mixture of provision that relies on a lot of trading and markets. And of course, we all remember to include beyond home, our house making, our house building is home making. So much more is needed than just having the building and having the space. Uh, again, something that's self-evident and obvious, but always worth recording. Now I'm going to stop talking for half a second and allow you to say something. What is the opposite of competition? Excellent. <laughs> Most of my students would spontaneously say cooperation. Um, but where we have competition, we can't have competition without cooperation. They are not opposed. 
Uh, think of any of the competitions or forms of competition that we're familiar with, like sports, uh, an essay competition, competition for jobs, a bidding for a contract. That has to be structured by cooperation. We have to have cooperation so that the framework is agreed and the terms of fairness are agreed and shared and so on. So without cooperation, we can't really have competition. As I say, my students spontaneously say cooperation is the opposite of competition, but actually monopoly is the opposite. We need competition in our markets so that they can be efficient and deliver. And Adam Smith was among the first to draw this home to us and to warn us how people in business, as soon as they come together, their first topic of conversation, he says, in the wealth of nations, is to see how they, the merchants, can fleece the public, his words. Uh, so it's a very important that we oblige the people in business who are in the markets, who are selling us goods and services, that we oblige them to compete. Merchants must be made to compete uh, in order that the markets that we rely on to provide us what we want will be effective and efficient. Now, among the conditions for markets to be effective and efficient are, are property rights. People won't enter into trade, into business, unless they have some assurance that what they bring to the market as theirs for sale or what they take from the market as theirs as purchased is theirs and is not prone to being arbitrarily taken from them. So secure property rights are a precondition for effective markets. Markets are essential for trading. Trading is needed for us to provide for ourselves all that we need to live well. Another precondition, of course, for markets is stable currency. Inflation is the big threat, as we know, once again, uh, to having that. And then that contracts are enforceable, and people in economics bring home to us uh, the importance of these preconditions. We need cooperation, however, to regulate and to structure and to operate our markets. And for that regulation, cooperation is essential. My next question, what is politics? Well, again, a simple answer. Politics is the way a society goes about determining answers to some critical questions. Two basic ones are, well, what does it mean for us to live well? How do we want to live? What belongs to all, you know, all that we are looking for so that we can live well? Determining those things is uh, a political um, question, partly because what some people will answer might be incompatible with what other people will answer, and so we have a conflict, not just a disagreement, a conflict between the goals pursued by some and the goals pursued by others, and therefore we need to find a way of conciliating or resolving that conflict. Disagreement is where people hold different things. Uh, we, I might meet somebody who believes the Earth is flat. And I say, but look at, this, look at the pictures from space. And I'll be told, well, that's all a conspiracy theory to persu persuade you. Well, I can part from this person and say, look, we'll agree to differ. You believe the Earth is flat. I don't think it is. I think it's a sphere in the, heat, in the solar system. The problem is if that person gets a job training the pilots who are to fly the planes that I'm going to travel in, then I, it's not just that he disagrees with me, it's that he threatens my well-being because he is disseminating views that will lead to air crashes and I don't want that to happen. So conflict arises when the goals that we pursue are incompatible, uh, mutually frustrating. And you know, trivial examples, nationalization is incompatible with privatization. And what we have to do is find a way of, of uh, opting for one or the other or conciliating the differences. Now that's the first point about politics. How do we determine what it is for us to live together well? But then we also have to determine who will have a responsibility to take decisions, to deliver, to give leadership. Uh, and that's about persons. 
this double agenda in politics is a source of um, difficulty for us, I suggest. We ask the two questions, what do we want? But who do we want to be in power to deliver for us? So politics reduces, in many cases, to this conflict for power, getting into position to be able to deliver what it is thought is worth having. Now, our problem when it comes to talking about housing and the housing crisis and similar difficulties is that the danger is there that persons trump policies, persons trump the programs. That insofar as we raise questions about wh wh what are the causes of our crisis, where have things gone wrong, and we spell out the times and places where the wrong decisions perhaps were made, there will always be the political parties or the political actors who want to exploit that in order to accuse their opponents. Instead of the dynamic being one of learning, it becomes one of the ongoing struggle to be in power, to do down the opponent and have a greater chance of coming to power oneself. Scoring points can undermine an honest reflection and an honest learning about about uh, our difficulties. And there's a similar problem when we look ahead, when we see the kind of strategy that will be needed to deal with the housing problem is one that's going to take decades. You know, it has been decades in the making of the dis dissolution, the, the breakdown of what we had relied upon previously for the delivery of housing, but to to build up, for instance, the resources for the state itself to be directly involved in the provision of housing will take a long time because there has not been the continuity there of personnel and of experience. So why will politicians now take the political risk of investing and of building up something where they themselves or their party will no longer be in power to enjoy the kudos and the benefit for the investment that's done now? Uh, maybe their opponent will, will get the benefit down the road. So it's a tricky issue for democratic politics to engage in addressing crises like the housing crisis that will require long-term strategic planning and therefore cooperation across the board to deliver that long-term uh, vision and planning. So what is A, the, our common good? You see the common good, is there a the common good, a singular? Are there many common goods? Well, I rely on Aristotle, although the notion of common good is very much part of Catholic social teaching. It's one of the four pillars, as you'll, as you'll recall, the dignity of the human person, the common good, solidarity and subsidiarity. These are the four fundamental pr principles and pillars of Catholic social thought. But originally, the notion of common good is developed in Greek philosophy by Aristotle. And his principles are rather straightforward. Whoever acts is acting for some good, and whoever is cooperating. When people are acting together, they are acting together for some good in common. And he thinks there are many kinds of cooperation and many forms of good that are common goods. Tennis clubs, sports clubs, religious organizations, business organizations, and so on. Each has its own distinctive good in common for the sake of which the people involved collaborate. Aristotle then asks, is there a highest good? Is there a supreme common good? And he suggests that the highest form of cooperation is the cooperation we see in politics, in the running of the city, the polis, uh, where people with virtues of justice and friendship come together to deliberate about what is their good and the good they, ent they, they hope to achieve, he names the good life, the good life, which is excellence in the exercise of all the human capacities uh, for, for good, for noble action. Now, um, that's a vision of the good life that in the Christian dispensation was challenged because our Augustine, and of course many before him will also have said, with the reality of sin, it's not the case that humans acting together can achieve the highest good because we are so burdened by sinful tendencies. We rely on coercion in politics. 
coercion is inevitable in politics is not just a matter of us all nicely agreeing and being friendly with one another. The reality of politics, as had been seen through the Roman Empire, is of domination, domination and exploitation. So politics is not a, a way of achieving the highest good. All the more so when in the Christian dispensation, Augustine is able to say, the highest good, of course, is God. God is our ultimate common good that final cause towards whom we are drawn, even when we don't know it, uh, that is our ultimate good and the ultimate good that Christians hope for especially is to see the face of God, to see the glory of God in the face of Christ, as Paul says in the letter to the Corinthians, to be in the resurrection in heaven with, with the Lord. So politics is not the way of delivering the highest good the ultimate common good according to Augustine and then Aquinas. However, we can still learn quite a bit from Aristotle. And in my work on this, I formulate two criteria that we can see Aristotle himself relying on for filtering out candidates that could be common goods from candidates that are not common goods. And the first criterion is if any individual or group is systematically excluded from a fair share of the goods we pursue together, then the arrangements we have put in place to provide those goods for ourselves do not succeed in realizing the common good. Now, this is something that Aristotle points out when he compares different constitutions, and he's a, 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 a very neat little question is the form of rule in the aristocracy or in the oligarchy, in the tyranny or in monarchy, is the form of rule for the benefit of the ruler or is the form of rule for the benefit of all, for the common good? And it's on the basis of that basic distinction that I formulate this principle. If we are cooperating, are there groups that are systematically excluded from a share in the goods for the sake of which we cooperate? And if there are such people systematically excluded, not necessarily deliberately, mind, I'm not saying deliberately excluded, but systematically excluded, then is it not the case that we have to doubt that our good for the sake of which we cooperate is genuinely common when so many are not part of it? The second criterion focuses on the quality of the good that we identify as our common good. And this Aristotle does when he compares different constitutions, like the constitution of Sparta sees the values of the military virtues as exemplifying good living, while a, commercial, a commercially based society focused on generating wealth, like an oligarchy, sees wealth and the possession of wealth as exemplifying the good. So which elements of genuine good are excluded from our vision of the life we make together? And if it is the case that we are systematically excluding some dimension of human good, then that which we are doing is not for the common good. So this is again picking up what I've said. Augustine says politics cannot achieve the highest good. Aquinas, following on, defines law this way. Law is a reasonable directive for the common good of a society made by one in charge of the society and promulgated. It's a very rich definition and could have a lecture all to itself. Um, but I just draw your attention to this assumption that when he talks about law as directive towards the common good of the society made by one who has charge, we have to say, look, in our society, there is no one. In our democratic society, there is no one. Maybe it was the case one time that Eamon de Valera could look into his heart and know what was for the good of the Irish people, or de Gaulle could have done it for the French, but now we know there is no one who knows. There is no one church that knows in the sense of politically what is for the good of all. The church does know things that are appropriate to its mission. But knowing also is problematic. It isn't as if when we refer to the common good of our society that it's accessible somewhere in a dictionary or in an encyclopedia. We are in the process of working it out, which is why 
uh, you know, the questions I put down as belonging to politics. What is it that we want in our life together? And who is it we want to take responsibility to deliver that? Those are not things known in advance. We have to work those out. So we have to work those out by discussion and deliberation. That sometimes deteriorates, as we know, into bargaining and deal-making and um, uh, it, it can be something that appears less than rational. How do we know when we are getting it right? Well, this is where I move on to elaborating again some of those criteria, but now filtered through the, the Catholic perspective. In my parents' generation, people struggled to get a home. This was after the war. Um, and many of the houses that they eventually got, whether to buy or to rent, they named St. Jude. Do you recognize that? You'll see it often on a house named St. Jude. My father's home where I was a baby, it was St. Jude. Because St. Jude is the patron of hopeless causes. People thought it was hopeless. Would they ever be able to get a, a house? Uh, but they prayed to St. Jude, and that was part of their piety. And thank God then they, they celebrated when they got it. Gaudium et Spes, as you know, is the pastoral constitution for the church in the world of today from the Vatican Council. Gaudium, joy and hope. So it's worth just filling in those words with this image. The hope that people have for a home. And the joy that, <laughs> that they can experience when they get it. And when they have security in a home. So the, when the church says the joy and the hope of people of the world today, these are the joys and hopes of the church. And these are the joys we share with them and the hopes we share with them. And then the pains on the other side when, when there is frustration and these are not achieved. So the common good, according to the Gaudium et Spes, is the sum of those conditions of social life which allow social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. So the set of conditions that allow people to flourish. Now note that distinction between conditions and fulfillment. Fulfillment, of course, is that ultimate common good of life in God. But the church knew and knows that we don't have agreement on that, even among Christians, as to how they will describe what that ultimate fulfillment is. And in humankind, we don't have agreement on it. But yet, in the Vatican Council, the bishops wanted to say, look, we want to work with people of goodwill who will collaborate together to put in place the conditions that will allow people to achieve uh, a flourishing life, even if we are ultimately in disagreement about what the, the end of that flourishing life is. The conditions, a set, a sum total of conditions, uh, which are many and complex. And the, the many and the complex, just think of what we listed when I said, oh, an economy is there to provide all that is needed. The same paragraph from Gaudium et Spes refers to the exalted dignity proper to human persons and what that dignity of human persons requires. Everybody should have available to them everything necessary, all that is needed for leading a life truly human, such as food, clothing, and shelter. Shelter, a home. And then a listing of what are basic rights Echoing, of course, the Universal Declaration. The right to choose a state of life freely, to found a family, the right to education, to employment, to a good reputation, to respect, to appropriate information, and so on. So when the church uses the language of rights, it's, it's using a language that has come from a legal context to a certain extent, but it is not, these are not juridical statements like the Universal Declaration itself that can be uh, a source of... Um, legal um, cases. Um, it's, it's, it's aspirational. It's specifying what ought to be. It's moral language using legal terms rather than purely um, legal language. It's up to a society with its polity, with its politics, to translate 
that aspirational vision into concrete conditions that will deliver uh, on, on this vision. A later production by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace in 1987, so this is pretty well 20 years, 21 years after Gaudium et Spes. 1987 is also the year when Pope Paul VI, um, no big pardon, that was the 60s, Pope Paul VI had produced his now there's my, sorry. Pro produced his, develop his essay, his, his uh, letter on the development of peoples. 19, and then 1987, John Paul II brought out uh, an encyclical uh, commemorating that theme of the development of peoples. And the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace did a survey around the world to see what was happening in different countries in the world in relation to housing and homelessness. Now this is in the context as of development, of progress, where after 20 years of espousing progress from uh, Pope Paul VI up to John Paul II, they're reflecting there is a housing crisis. And they named this document, which is a powerful little document, What Have You Done to Your Homeless Brother? And it lists the basic needs of the person, education, food, housing, health care. The lack of sufficient housing must be considered a structural crisis. Housing is a universal right. And stresses again that element of Catholic social teaching that I think is neglected when it comes to the adoption of the respect for property in Ireland and in the Irish Constitution, namely the universal destination of material goods. Property is a right, but property should be used to serve persons that there is an obligation on property owners so to use their property that the common good is served. Uh, and, and, and that is neglected, I think, in the way in which we have received um, Catholic teaching, teaching on property rights in, in Ireland. I'll just mention these two principles, uh, criteria in Catholic social thought, solidarity, and subsidiarity, which I see as parallel in a Catholic voice to the two principles from Aristotle that I have presented earlier. So where should we locate common goods? Um, I'm, I've got two slides here. So the full set of conditions that enable people and groups to flourish, it's persons. We need people in power who have virtue and competence and who are able to take decisions and give leadership. We need conditions for them to act. These are among the goods we have in common, that we have such resources available to us, the shared language and knowledge, competencies, skills and virtues, material resources, and the opportunities to come together and deliberate and decide and implement. The actions that, we, that need to be taken, these are also among our common goods. It's not just the ultimate vision at the end. It is the conditions, the structures, the organizations, the institutions we put in place, the officers we put in place, the responsibilities that we designate for them that belong among our common good. So, my final and shortest section, achieving our common good. So we, we, we can agree. Among our common goods is a home, a shelter, a place to enjoy the privacy needed for raising a family. Definitely a home is a condition needed for a decent life. As well as that, the social institutions and structures that we rely on for providing ourselves with all that we need to live a humane life. These two belong among our common good. The institutions of property, of markets. And again, I want to emphasize, emphasize markets are things we put in place, that we manage, that we structure, or that we fail to structure, that we fail to manage, fail to regulate. But these institutions can be among our common goods along with the financial system, the organization of businesses, of crafts, of skills, and the governmental structures that we need. These can be among our common goods only if they work. Well, are they working? Well, I think we can look back at the way in which in our history, the, the, the first section where we've identified the problems, who is 
being excluded, not necessarily deliberately, but who is excluded from that share in the goods that we together are producing? Definitely the many people who can't get access to a home. They are being excluded. Uh, and we can ask then too, well, who is benefiting in the system that we have put in place? Who comes away from the provision of housing at the moment, the way it is so structured and the markets, that they benefit? And I think you'll agree that there is imbalance there, that we can give answers to those questions as to who is benefiting and who is losing out. And where that is the case, then definitely we have to say, look, this is not working for our common good. Are there aspects of the human good that are being excluded? Well, all, of that, all that goes with having the security of a place of one's own, a room of one's own, mentioned Virginia Woolf. <laughs> uh, in terms of Catholic social teaching, the topic of subsidiarity is very important and more could be said about it. But, but here the value is the empowerment for those without the means of controlling their own lives without demeaning them or reducing them to dependency. How people can be empowered to take responsibility and having access to a place is so important for them. Looking at, uh, sorry. Learning from our experiments then, I'm suggesting that there is something to be learned from our exaggerated emphasis on property rights in the 37 constitution. And it's reflected in the way in which the NEST reports can point to there are different forms of compulsory purchase orders that are operating in different domains of life because there is no coordinated, consistent way of seeing the entitlement of the state so to interact with private property rights that the common good is served. And there is definitely an imbalance there. And perhaps the Catholic teaching has had an impact there that we have to take responsibility for. I think Sheehan's apologetics that I was taught at school certainly didn't give us a sufficient grounding in the duties of property. It was much more about the rights of property, understood, of course, in the context of communism being the great threat in the 1930s, perhaps in the 1950s. But we have to admit there is an imbalance there that needs to be redressed. Perhaps we've identified an excessive reliance on the market for investment, you know, where the investment companies are assured of their return over a long-term lease of 25, 30 years, uh, but at whose expense, at whose cost? That way in which we have structured, we, our economy has, and our polity has structured the markets does need to be reviewed. And again, reverting to this danger of persons trumping, trumping policies or parties trumping programs, how we conduct our politics. Uh, are we able to address issues and face real crises honestly and admit the mistakes that had been made without turning that into a, a witch hunt, trying to identify who can be held accountable, who can be blamed, who can be punished for it. And I think the, the, the fear among uh, those who are responsible in our political life of exposing themselves to that kind of criticism does prevent the honest discussion that we need to have take place. So a, an issue for our political culture is, can we find a way of punishing those politicians and those parties that rush to seek to blame before we have adequately explored the, the issues that face us? draw your attention to the very comprehensive and adequate uh, analysis by the NESC study from 2020. Bridge the supply gap and they go through institutional uh, and instrumental and policy matters where, as I've tried to point out, these things too have to be seen as belonging among the goods in common that we have put in place so that we can provide for ourselves all that we need to live a decent life. The affordability gap similarly, um, and their suggestions there again refer to institutions and measures that could be put in place, including changing the structuring of access to land so that it is not the sole point of competition that drives up the price and where the, the benefit of extra prices is not redounding to the benefit of the 
of the community, of the public. So in terms of common goods then, the, the government program says housing for all. Yes, that's among our ends, not our ultimate end, because, but it is one of those conditions that is required for there to be a flourishing life, a decent existence. And so it is an end for which we need a whole set of conditions and means which will in turn be goals of our action and therefore our common goods. Policies, legislation, state institutions, finance, financing structures, uh, as well as forms of cooperation with private investment ventures. And so my conclusion is just to recall that outline that I've done for you. Uh, we've identified there is a problem, C. We try and uh, find a way of evaluating what we have seen and come to judgment. And for that, we've needed to build up uh, some criteria, some perspective, by thinking again, what do we mean by an economy and what do we expect from an economy? What do we expect from our politics? What is a common good? And then to move on to what to do, how do we uh, take steps to address the crisis by applying these criteria? The two criteria that we formulated, solidarity, who is excluded? Who fails to benefit from our cooperation that is quite extensive and complicated? Who fails to benefit? And on the other hand, who is privileged? Who is benefiting? And subsidiarity, are people being made dependent and uh, de deprived of the opportunity of themselves, being empowered to exercise their responsibility and autonomy in taking uh, charge of a home and building perhaps um, a new life, a life for themselves. And so then that question that was asked in 1987, let us hope that in another 20 years time, we will not have to face this question again. What have you done to your homeless brothers and sisters? Thank you for your attention. I want to uh, thank uh, Patrick Rudin for his, uh, his comprehensive review of some of the issues we're facing. I think uh, one of the things that strikes me here at the Newman Center for Faith and Reason is that this is the kind of thing we need to talk about. This is the kind of issue that we collectively need to continue pondering. Uh, I was hoping for a magic bullet. He didn't, he didn't have one. But I do think that we as a community need to ask ourselves, how do we want to continue the discussion? Is there a means for us to better inform ourselves, maybe read through some of these policies, uh, some of these uh, position papers, some of these reviews? Is there, uh, is there an opportunity for us to talk about what does a community of faith do in response to some of these pressing needs? We won't solve the problem, but we might be part of a solution to help begin a discussion, a reflection on what does it mean to be in solidarity with others and what does it mean to uh, empower others to live out those common goods that we, we all desire. But for tonight, I just want to once again thank uh, Father Reardon for his efforts and his work. We are going to have biscuits and tea in the back and we'll have an opportunity for us to ask some questions there. But uh, I want to thank you all for coming. It's our last lecture of the season, but do know that we will continue other lectures again in the fall. But if you want uh, to speak to me uh, about possibilities for us continuing to have maybe a couple of sessions, some meetings about what we might be able to do, uh, I would love to talk about it. We have, we have the summer. Thank you for coming. No, we're going to the back for tea and biscuits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.